Welcome into the 211th episode of the Young Terps podcast from the Viner Four Gates studio. We have a full show today breaking down the Terps 34 to 27 loss at the Big House. And of course, non rev Todd will join me in just a moment for the non rev report. And then Wayne Viner will join me to go over all things Terps football as Maryland hosts Michigan State. And now let's get to the non rev report. Todd, busy week, a lot of ranked matchups. Now let's get into the non rev report. Yeah, it was a busy week for, for just about everybody. Um, uh, starting off with field hockey, who played on Tuesday and went to number seven, then number seven, Princeton. Princeton, I think, has fallen to eight in the latest poll, uh, where they had a tough double overtime loss, uh, four to three. But then they got back, came home, got back-to-back conference wins, uh, one to nothing in overtime over Michigan, who's also ranked. And then kind of cruised on Sunday against Michigan State 7-2, to two, which was just sort of an easy, easy game for them. Yeah, and a couple of big matchups coming in. The number five uh, Iowa Hawkeyes Maryland will take on uh, this week. And Todd, they beat the number one team in the country. Yeah, they did on on uh, on the road as well. So Northwestern was number one, the defending national champ. And uh, Iowa went in and beat them two to nothing, I think, on the road last week. So actually, Iowa has has jumped up uh, to number two in the polls this week, if polls mean anything. And uh, Northwestern uh, has has fallen down a little bit. Maryland fell to number four based on their loss. But the Big Ten still has five teams in the top ten. And then, of course, uh, after they play at Iowa, they have to go to the Terps have to go to Northwestern. So these are going to be two real nail biters, I think. Yeah, I I would think so. It should be two really good games for Maryland. And, you know, the, when you play a non-conference schedule like Maryland, you get to this point where it just seems like all year they've been playing number seven, number five, number two. Is Maryland, yeah. have they played the hardest schedule in the country, or or is there a strength of schedule for field uh, hockey? You know, it's it's tough because field hockey is, is generally so concentrated with the top teams kind of here in the East and mainly in the ACC and the Big Ten uh, that that and there's an ACC Big Ten challenge or a Big Ten ACC challenge every year. So there's always going to be a lot of tough competition. But, you know, I think that Missy Maharg is one of the coaches at Maryland who believes in scheduling tough games early in the season. John Tillman does it. Brenda Fries in women's basketball has taken to doing it. Kathy Reese obviously always does. Sasho does. You know, I mean, because, again, if you want to if you want to get yourself ready for postseason play, you've got to play tough games early. It, it exposes your your weaknesses and it highlights your strengths. And so, you know, the coaches know where to focus. And I should mention, by the way, that uh, Sophie Klautz won uh, freshman of the week in the Big Ten this week for the second time uh, this season. Yeah. And with that tough week coming up for field hockey, we'll move on to volleyball and Todd, not the start that we talked about the Terps needing uh, last week, 0-2 this week. Yeah, really, really tough. They lost 3-1 at uh, Illinois. Uh, And Illinois is is unranked right now this year. They're kind of a middle-of-the-pack team. They're not the team they were a few years ago when they had Jordan Poulter at their setter and a couple of really great middle blockers and an outside hitter who was terrific. Uh, And it would have been still a kind of a signature win for Maryland to go on the road They've never beaten Illinois, uh, and to, to get that win would have really kicked off their season very well. And then they came home and lost in five sets on Sunday uh, to uh, Indiana and the former coach Steve Aird. Um, so that was a that was a tough. I mean, Maryland really had an opportunity to start the season two and zero, and now they they start zero and two, and they're at home this weekend. They they play Michigan State and uh, Nebraska on Friday and then Nebraska on Sunday. And the Nebraska game, believe it or not, they announced as already sold out. Yeah, Todd, you took my line. I was just going to mention that they, they, it looks like they have packed the PAV for that game against Nebraska, which uh, probably will not be going Maryland's way unless, unless we see something miraculous like we did uh, about a year ago, almost to the day against Wisconsin. 
That's that's right. You know, Maryland was one of only two teams to beat the eventual national champs last year. The other one was Purdue, who actually beat Wisconsin twice. Um, yeah, ne- Nebraska currently sitting at number three in the country, and and certainly well worth well deserving of that ranking and a, a perennial powerhouse. And it will be another one of those miracles. And and Maryland's going to have to really raise the level of their play. They just they need to figure out a way to win the big points when the big points come. Yeah, and it just felt like they, they started off slow. I know against Indiana, I was following that one on Twitter, they dropped the first set. And this team, um, they're going to have to find their way if they finally want to break through, but n- not the most inspiring start for the Terps on the court. Now to uh up and down week that we saw on the pitch, uh, the Terps men's soccer team one zero and one this week, and they tied Penn State. And I know we were texting a little bit during the game three three on Thursday with uh, some of the most questionable refereeing that I've seen in a while uh, in an NCAA soccer game. Yeah, you know, Mason, I, I it was interesting that you you noticed that because I felt like the the quality of the officiating overall in both the men's and the women's games in the NCAA has dropped off this year and, and really been, you know, there've been a lot of questionable officiating that game in particular had had a couple of just really highly questionable calls. One that benefited Maryland, certainly uh, which gave Maryland a penalty kick that gave them a lead after they trailed at halftime uh, two to one. And they, um, you know, the, the, but from what I heard from you and from people who were watching on TV, uh, that that was a very questionable call in favor of Maryland. From my angle, it was hard to tell. And so I always try to give the officials the benefit of the doubt because it's always they, a lot of the times these calls are based on the angle that the official sees the call. Yeah, and that one definitely could have played into the penalty kick in favor of the Terps. And I'm sorry. That matchup was on Tuesday of last week. I just said it was on Thursday, but it was on Tuesday night. It was on Big Ten Network. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was just However, all around poor yeah. refereeing. I mean, there were fouls called. I, I felt like it was going both ways. And, you know, you don't really factor in the angle because you get that zoomed in shot on TV. But it just seemed like a couple things were missed. Um, and, you know, Maryland started off fast and then they give up those two goals and just game kind of it. It, it was played to a tie. Uh, I'll put it that way, and and that's one that Maryland probably wishes they had back, and and probably should go in the win column for Sasha, but it didn't. Pro- probably you're right, but uh, you know, I mean, based on the way the game went, it felt kind of like a fair result. I will say that Maryland has uh, moved up one spot actually from number nine to number eight in the polls and the game uh penn state has now entered the the latest poll coming in at number 20 that maryland did get a nice win sunday their first clean sheet of the year one nothing over ohio state who came in and ranked 13th and despite the loss has bumped up to number 11 in the most recent poll that came out today yeah and that goes with a tie uh that same week against Cleveland State. so Right. And it was the freshman that broke through early in that one. Kind of had the same start. Maryland, a lot of pressure at the beginning of the game uh, on Ohio State. They also start off strong against Penn State, and it was Riley that broke through for the Terps, and they hold on. Yeah, they managed to hold on, which, again, you know, Sasho, I think, was very pleased to have a clean sheet for the first time this year. You know, we remember a couple of years ago, three years, four years ago, when Maryland – Cruz went went out to the national championship. They they ran through the entire NCAA tournament without giving up a goal. And just an, another quick uh, note on that: uh, Nick Richardson uh, put another trophy in Maryland's case, uh, winning Defensive Player of the Week in the conference. And the Terps roll on that side on the women's side. Maryland zero and two on the week. But Todd, you have it in your notes for me that uh, it's an encouraging, even though the fact they dropped both games. Yeah, I thought I thought it was that they lost at home to Illinois, uh, three to two. Um, Illinois came in five, three and one. They had a terrible loss to Penn State after they left Maryland. Um, But Maryland had the lead at halftime. Illinois scored three straight. It's a quality team, Um, you know, and again, Maryland hadn't until they beat Michigan. They hadn't won in nearly two years in, in conference. 
And uh, truthfully, the, the third goal that turned out to be the game-winning goal for Illinois was just a bad break for Maryland. We, they were uh, Illinois was kind of on the attack. Maryland had a good opportunity to clear, and one player for Maryland just whack the ball into the backside of another Maryland player and it bounced right at the feet of, of an Illinois player who was, you know, had an open shot uh, 10 yards from the goal and, and that was it. But they fought back. They, they nearly got even. And then they went out to uh, play up at the then number four, who's actually fallen to number 10 after the last poll. And I'm not sure why, which was Rutgers. And they went on the road and, and held them scoreless for almost 88 minutes. Yeah, and that Rutgers team, they're a great soccer team. They're a great team and, and a really solid program. And, you know, Meg Ryan Nemzer, Maryland's coach, uh, came from Rutgers. She both played – she's she's originally from Crofton, but she both played and was an assistant coach at Rutgers. So she's very familiar with that program. I know going up there, she said it would be very odd going into the visitors' uh, side and coming in and out of the visitors' locker room. But – um you know, credit to them. They they built up late play. The goal again was actually kind of a fluky goal. If you, I, I don't know if you saw it, but it but it was a ball that that kind of bounced around in the box, and the goalie came out and tried to grab it, and it took a funny bounce away from her and left her out of position, and and just uh, she couldn't recover to make the save. Yeah, in this game, Todd, I was following on Twitter. And there's one thing that bothered me that I got to bring up is I'm following on Maryland women's soccer Twitter, which does a pretty good job of following the games. And they never put a tweet out that Rutgers scored. So I'm like scrolling back after they released the final that Maryland lost. And I was like scrolling back through the entire game of tweets, trying to figure out if they gave up a goal in like the first minute and Rutgers just kind of packed it in, which isn't, isn't the way that Rutgers plays. Um, But I couldn't figure out why they lost the game. And until you, um, put in the notes that Rutgers broke through in the 87th minute, which makes a lot of sense given uh, the way the game was out there. But the Terps, a couple of tough ones coming up. Wisconsin, uh, who's 8-1-2 yeah. and two coming into the game, 3-0 and oh in the conference. And uh, Michigan State, who they'll host on Sunday, who is 7-1-3 and three and is 2-0-1 uh, oh in the league. Yeah, so the, the Terps will be at Wisconsin, and they've moved into the into the – uh, polls this week at number 23. So they're one of uh, four ranked Big Ten teams, Rutgers at 10, Penn State at eight, and Northwestern at six. So it's going to be tough uh, road for, for the Terps to make that jump. But Meg Ryan is doing such a great job and uh, has changed the culture uh, at Maryland, and they're fighting through. And, and it's a really entertaining product. And for folks who like women's soccer, I really urge people to get out and, and go to the games. And you know that you notice that this week, Michigan State has three teams coming into Maryland, football on Saturday, uh, volleyball on, on Sunday. And you mentioned Michigan State uh, women's soccer. Uh, also, um, uh, I, I believe Thursday night. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, it was really interesting because Maryland, I'm surprised the big 10 doesn't do this more often. Uh, when Maryland was in the big 10, the first or second year, a buddy of mine and I actually drove out to Iowa on Halloween weekend because the volleyball team played Friday night, the field hockey team played Saturday morning and the football team played, uh, Saturday afternoon. So we left here on Thursday, drove to Iowa, watched the three games and came home Sunday. Yeah, I remember you talking about that trip, and Todd, it's volleyball at home Friday night, football at home Saturday afternoon, and women's soccer at home oh. on Sunday. So oh, right. Just Thanks for, for the correction, because it's Nebraska who's who's in on Sunday yeah, for volleyball. Nebraska on Sunday for volleyball. Yeah, I, I actually agree with that, and it's, you know, it gives fans, because the Big Ten has a lot of fans that like to travel around, gives you more than one game to go to, it gives you a reason, or more of a reason to go other than just football. Correct. Yeah. I, and, it, and it just makes it a really great experience. I have to tell you, it was a great experience for us when we went out. Maryland went two and one that weekend, by the way. Uh, football did lose. Yeah, that one was a beatdown. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but it, it's, uh, you know, again, it's something that the Big Ten will do. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to seeing things uh, shape up this weekend. Hopefully uh, when you and Wayne get to talking about football, um You'll pro, pro, uh, preview that game, and is surprisingly, that Terps is surprising seven and a half point favorite. I think I read recently. Yes, they are seven and a half point favorite. 
And uh, a tough, it looks like a tough week coming up for the non-revs, Todd. So we'll catch up with you next week and uh, go over all the results and give a look ahead uh, as we enter October already. Can you believe that? Yeah, hard to believe. Welcome, welcome to fall. Yes, it is. All right, Todd, thanks for joining. Sure, uh, Mason, pleasure. Now we welcome in Wayne Viner to the show. And last week, the name of our episode was Time to Compete, question mark. And whether it was time or not, competition did happen on the field at the Big House on Saturday. Michigan 34, Maryland 27, and it was that close. It was a close game. Maryland, in my mind, probably should have been tied despite everything that happened at halftime. And then, yeah, chances were there to to win the game. And no, it didn't happen, but the chances were there. And for those who listened to the last podcast, that's really all we asked for, is that you had the ball or a chance to get the ball and tire win the game, and that occurred. So that's good. A few penalties, a few injuries, but they were key injuries. One. One penalty. One penalty. Yeah, they didn't call a whole lot there. And either way, the refs did not have a good day in Ann Arbor. Uh, and, and that's on the list, and we'll get to it. But uh, game breakdown for you guys. First downs, Maryland 23, Michigan 22. Third down efficiency, Terps 6 for 14 on the day, Michigan 5 for 12. Fourth downs, Maryland converts three. They go three for three, most of which on the last drive. Michigan 1 for 1, the Blake Corbin touchdown run. And we'll, we'll talk about Blake Corbin in a minute. That guy can play himself some football. Uh, running yards, Maryland 128, they could have had a lot more. Michigan, 243, and through the air, Maryland throws the ball for 269 yards. Michigan, 4 220. Fairly even statistical game. For most of the breaks go to Michigan. Most of those were Maryland-inflicted breaks that go to Michigan. I, certainly, you can start the game, the ball. I'll tell you, Ty Felton's face mask does not have good hands. Ball hits him right in the head, goes to Michigan, they score in the next play. Uh, I was looking through fast to see if there's a fastest time to score in the Maryland record book. I didn't find it. But I would assume that eight seconds is probably the fastest time to score an opening touchdown by either team, uh, possibly in the history of Maryland football. So there's one thing that went wrong. The interceptions that weren't, that were called on against Leah, I'll say. And I understand in both cases, if you really went to replay, Michigan didn't intercept either one of those passes. No, and And then look, the, the, the third thing, and we can go back on these, the third thing is a couple times when Maryland had a chance to sort of shut Michigan down and set the edge, both cases, Blake Corum broke to the outside and scored. And both times, Blayton holds on the play if you look at the freeze frames. Yeah. So, refs didn't have a great day. Maryland almost overcomes it. I'm greatly encouraged. And, you know, Loxley can do all his coach speak that doesn't matter. And either you win the game or you lose the game, which is true. But you, both you and I have said that you don't go from losing these games, for the most part, 60-3 to 3 or 49-20 to 20 to winning them. You go from losing them 60-3 to 3 to being in a game like you were in Ann Arbor. Now you can take the next step and win these games. So a couple of comments on that. All, I agree with those points, and the first thing that I will say, and I'll point it out, is after the game, of course, still disappointed they lost because I felt like they had a real chance to break through here and, and get this win. This week's game matters just as much as last week, if not more. It doesn't mean anything if you come out and you lose this football game to a Michigan State team that we'll talk about a little bit, but just looks bad at this moment you got to come out and you got to win the next game that's such a big part of um, being being the team you want to be is winning this next football game is mm -hmm. continuing to bring the effort even though you got close and you didn't get there is winning this game build a football culture the we second thing and possibly the biggest thing with this is you don't this is why transfer teams don't win Teams that are built on just transfer guys. And USC is was winning some football games. They almost lost to Oregon State on the road this last week. You don't go from being a bad team 
to being a good team. That's why when you hear coaches talk about transfers, they're additions. They don't make your team. You, If you have a good culture, if you have a good group of guys, and you add to that, and those guys buy in, yeah, you can end up with some really successful parts coming into a, a already functioning team. But I think that this showed that that when Michael Oxley took over, he brought in a handful of transfers, guys, that contributed a lot to the team. And I think you're seeing that change of, you call it football culture, I'll just call it, um, I almost see it as guys that like playing football together and, and guys that really want to be there day in and day out. They show up to play on Saturday. You know, they could have every time we've seen that first play of the game. Ball hits the guy in the face mask, rolls to the eight-yard line, three Michigan guys fall in the football Next play is a touchdown. I thought they were going to pack it in. I thought they were going to quit. I re- that was just that moment where you're like, ah, shit, here we go again. We're losing this game 59-6. Yep. to six. Yep, and I said Texas. They threw an yep. interception. Piggy threw an interception, like the third play of the game, and, and we didn't quit there. Maybe, maybe that's a harbinger that we're not going to do it here. And So, anyhow, you, you – you brought this up in the SMU game, that there were moments in that game when you expected a Maryland team from old to lose the game. It happened again on Saturday. You expected the Maryland team from old to show up and just fold. Much to their credit, they don't. They fight back in a big way. Yeah, they do. And whatever we can do to get our man Antoine Littleton the ball needs to be done at this point. This guy, he's got to play. He is he's the starting running back of a team. He is the guy and he's the star of this team if you used him, right? Yeah. I I've won and this is going to sound stupid. A lot of games in like Madden with a guy like Antoine Littleton that just yeah. runs the ball. Line up in the I formation and run the football. Like and this is me and for those of you who don't know, I'm a younger person who didn't live when Jerry Claiborne was coaching Maryland football and we are lining up with Charlie Wysocki back there and running the ball 100 times a game if we could. But at this point, this team is successful off of a handful of plays. It's the same play set. You can line up in the shotgun. Ohio State runs my favorite offense. Or Urban Meyer, Ohio State, with JT Barrett ran my favorite offense that I've seen in Braxton Miller. The power shotgun, the power spread, where they had running backs like Ezekiel Elliott who – like Antoine Littleton, carried guys for five yards. You can still spread the other team out and run a power offense, but right now we're seeing elements of that. And then this just disaster of we're going to throw the ball, straight drop back, shotgun, five-step drop, holding onto the ball for four, five to seven seconds. I don't understand why when you can run the ball successfully, you don't stick to it. But Well, I have my theories, and they're not positive, but that there's some stat hunting going on. You've got first-round draft picks. You need to use them. They think there's got these wide receivers that are first-round draft picks. And we have a guy who is all over the top of the Maryland record books and throwing the ball, and we're just going to do that. And, man, I, I, I love the fact that those guys are out there. But, boy, that offensive line can pound the rock. And but the- time and again in the second half when they came out and passed the ball, like, please – Run the darn ball. you got to keep your defense off the field. Run the ball. Use the, the clock. The biggest advantage of a team that can throw the ball is that everybody's looking at you to throw the ball, and you can run the ball as much as you want. Well, if they come into the box, if they start bringing the safeties down, my goodness, we and, got and, them and, and at that's that point. The, well, the concern right now is that we don't. You know, I, I liked what we saw in the first half a lot. I think if Maryland ran that offense, this almost same exact play sequence, the shots down the field, that just make you think. If you're on the other side and you're coaching that, and, man, they're running the ball, getting five yards a carry. Okay, let me bring my safety down. Let me bring in my, you know, let me pull my star linebacker out of the game and put another inside linebacker in the game. And suddenly, there goes C.J. Dupree for 30 yards on the tight end screen. You know, there goes Corey Deitch's wide open, even though he dropped the ball. And those kinds of plays where I'm saying, okay, we got this guy on the outside, He's an NFL draft pick. It was Rock Him Chair. It was any of Maryland's guys, really. And on the other end, they got the same. So now I'm, well, if you, I'm playing my two high safeties, they got to hover the wide receivers. And either I'm going to end up with man to man or the linebacker on the tight end or the safety on the tight end. I like our chances either way. So even if it isn't your weapons beating them, the next guy right now is 
I mean, Barrett's tight ends are having a great year. Well, Ty Felton might be your next guy. He scored a touchdown. If you got Demas and Rock out there and Copeland becomes your next guy and he caught a few balls, it's there to be done. But in watching the game, it just reinforces that this is a rhythm, you call it a system offense, where if you can get the defense to bite on the play action, Maryland and Leah can get them the ball. If he just drops back to throw the ball, he's not as effective. Just not there. I don't know why. Now, you brought up that Deitches play where the ball glanced off his hands, and on that play, I believe, is the one that Leah really got popped. And one of the big notes for Michigan State coming up is there's a possibility you don't have Leah. There's a stronger possibility you don't have Rakim Jarrett, who hit his head on the turf. They don't call it a concussion, just hit his head on the turf. We'll see if he plays. But right now, indications are he's probably not going to play. And Ruben Hippolyte is still your best linebacker, probably not going to play. Well, he was full go of practice today. All right. Well, I didn't get a thumbs up. In fact, I got some of the – when uh talked to Ahmad McCullough, and he still says, his, from my take, his guy is hurt. So we'll see where that goes. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big game because it's the next game. And you still look down the schedule – and I've said this before on the air here, limited limited faith and great expectations. I'm still not sure what I'm seeing. I'm still not sure I see an identity. If they come out and play bully ball and, and pound the rock to set up the pass, my level of uh, happiness is going to go up and my level of faith is going to go up in this system. But right now, just being a straight throwing offense isn't working. You have Michigan State, you said, is not as good as they had hoped. In talking to Mike Loxley today, he pointed out, you got to remember, that they look pretty bad against two top 25 teams. So they're still a well-coached football team. And that was some stiff competition. Minnesota's legitimately good. And I believe the other game was, was Washington. Yeah, it was looking really good right now. Yeah, and Michael this is Michael Penix? Yes. Yeah. the quarterback who was at Indiana, uh, leading a revival of Washington football. Yeah, He's, great change of scenery right there. Yeah. Transfer quarterback seemingly working out out there. But big, big, different, totally different game. A lot of injuries, change of scenery. Very so, successful. So you got Michigan State, which I would put down as a winnable game, and, and so does Las Vegas. Well, hold on. Before you get into the schedule, yeah. I'll give you the same snapshot. When you're talking about what a good team did to them, if you're trying to talk about where Maryland's going to end up. A good team did to whom? To Michigan State. Minnesota, Michigan State, I'll give you the same stats. Minnesota, 31 first downs, Michigan State, 14. Michigan or uh, Minnesota was 10 for 12 on third down, mm-hmm. Michigan State, 2 for 8. Uh, they don't go for it on fourth down. They run the ball for 240. They pass it for 268. Michigan State gets 38 yards on the ground on the day, 202 in the air. Minnesota puts up, Minnesota puts up 508 yards, Michigan State. Uh, 240. Minnesota only one sack, though. No interceptions. And uh, they do recover a fumble. Time of possession. Minnesota 42 minutes wow. and 30 seconds with the football. Michigan State has the ball for 17-30. Look, Peyton Thorne's, I think, still a good quarterback. I- I'm not sure how good Jalen Berger is a tailback or Keon Coleman is a, is a wide receiver. They just don't have the stats. But they struggled. My, my point is, without going through all the games, is that Maryland still has a shot at a pretty good season here. You, you can make the case for if they can get their act together, they might win three or four of these games in a row. And then, of course, you hit that Hall of Fame lineup of at Wisconsin, at Penn State, and then Ohio State. So, now, A lot of people throwing that Wisconsin one in there with the wins, uh, with a chance to be a win. That's a tough place to play. It's a tough place to go. And, and it's going to be cold. Yeah. So, is Blake Corm as good as he looked? I think he is. I mean, I legitimately knew that he was going to be a problem in this game. It was really, really hard to judge Michigan coming in. Um, I don't know what. I don't know why they canceled that game with UCLA. I, I really don't know. It looks like they needed a challenge before. Um, you know, Rutgers played him tough last year, one score game in the Big House. So there, there is something, you know, to that. They don't really play anybody. That first game for them is usually tough. 
I think we'll know a lot more about what kind of team Maryland faced on Saturday after this week. At Iowa, Michigan will go and talk about a defense. I mean, terrible offense for Iowa, but that defense plays themselves some football. That coach, Phil Parker, who coaches the defense for Iowa, is just a great, great defensive mind in the game. Um, just that bounce to the outside, that left-to-right running, the vision that Blake Corum plays with is is next level. I mean, he... If you even if you watch those runs, holds, not holds, whatever you want to say. The fact that they're running power, whatever they probably call it, like, you know, power 90 with the big boys in there trying to run it up the middle. And he sees Maryland crash the play and not really looking, not looking where the running back's going, just predictable percentage-wise football, crash the middle. And he sees it, just quick little hit move. He's bouncing, he's on the well, outside, he's gone. That's what McCullough said to me today is that they just figured he was going up the middle and he, he just got away and set the edge because he was going up the middle. I mean, that's what everybody does. Which is, I think it's fair. You're trying okay. to win that game, you got to sell it to stop him going up the middle. So that's the, the first run. The second run, you see Bo Braid sort of pop his head through and instead of going to his lane, which was outside, he tried to short circuit the play and he was a half a second late. If he's there a one half a step sooner, he bl- he gets through there, and he could he could get a shot on him in the backfield. But he gets caught up in the line. He's not in the outside lane. There's nobody there to set that edge, and Corm's gone. But you you aren't going to win this game without taking a chance or two. And he he tried to make the play. And that's what I think Lox is probably going to talk to a lot of these guys about this week when they look at the film is. Yeah, that's great. You try to make a play. Yeah, everybody here wants to win that game. You got to do your job. It's fourth and one. You got to fill your gap. We know that they will beat us if we don't fill our gaps. We might have one or two guys, Dante Trader, Bo Braid. They they go in that pile. Guys that can make a big play that's going to impact the game. But there are certain times where you have to know I have to do my job on this play. And playing defense is a lot more disciplined than that I need to do my job than it is on the offensive side of the ball. You got to fill your gap. You got to fill your rush lane. Those are things that everybody knows that they teach it. If you've been taught right for Pop Warner on, when we're running run fits, yeah, they call it fits. You got to fit your gap. You got to take away the gaps, and then together we need to make a play. I thought Caleb Wheatland did a really, really good job of that. I thought Maryland's inside linebackers surprisingly played well because if you go back and you look at the film on the game, there's a couple of those wheel routes that Michigan's really beaten us up on over the years. As Ahmed as others. McCullough's picking it up. Yep. Ruben Hippolyte picked one up, or Hippolyte didn't play. Um, Jay Sean Barham picked one up. Fanange Gote, who you kind of expect to, but he didn't, you know, he hasn't in the past. Maryland was tracking those plays well. Now, J.J. McCarthy, the deep shots were there. He's just not. The, the plays were there to be made. He overthrew the ball consistently. And on TV, they have a lot of credit to the Maryland defense. I'm not so sure it's the Maryland so, defense or that he just couldn't. Hit his receivers. Joel Klatt does a podcast. Um, and he addressed this point first thing on his show. Who is the color the analyst color on the game. The color guy with Gus Johnson on the game. And he said, really, what you just said. You know, on the broadcast, a lot of Michigan people were giving him, you know, heat on Twitter for praising Maryland so much and not talking about how bad Michigan was. Because a lot of the Michigan fans are not very happy about this game. And I watched, it was about six or seven minutes he went on this. I watched about five minutes of it. And he said, you know, and it's something that I can kind of agree with as somebody that's called games where teams are getting throttled or good teams are letting other teams in, you know, opening the door up for them to cause an upset. But if you listen to that, it's on YouTube, it's on his podcast. Um, he does say, you know, Michigan's expectation is that they're going to win the college football playoff and win this game by 40. But when you're evaluating the game, and especially what you see on TV, when a quarterback throws a deep ball and, you know, the receiver has been catching the ball from that guy for 10 months, a year, whatever it may be. A lot of times, both players can tell that the ball is going to be overthrown about two, three seconds before the ball actually hits the ground or gets caught. Yeah. And a lot of people like, you know, we'll watch the game. You can see it's overthrown. It's... Now, the receiver, a lot of times, will make a really hard push to get that ball to make a play for their quarterback. The defensive back sometimes they don't chase it down you know and this is this isn't from this i've heard him say this before so when you're saying you know uh maryland you know we're giving credit to maryland's defense back to what he was saying 
like, yeah, you're watching the game. They're not giving them windows to throw the ball. There's guys in the rush lane. They're getting everyone's face, and their job isn't to sit there and, while they talked about Michigan a ton, their job's not to sit there and say, ah, oh, Michigan sucks today. You know, Maryland's just in this game because he's missing 10 deep balls. It's not their job. Their job's to evaluate the game, and it would have been a great moment for Maryland football if they won that game. It's a huge step forward for them to, to do it. And then in the eyes, clearly in the eyes, if you listen to the national media perspective on this, Maryland's going the right direction. People love locks, like Kirk Herbstreit. He loves Mike Loxley. And it kind of goes to the whole coaching tree thing. These guys know and get information from these coaches year in, year out, school to school, place to place, and they're not in it. Nobody is in media right now, and some people complain about it a lot. Other people don't. A lot of people that are right in the beat doing this inside scoop thing, they're almost in it to promote the schools at this point. They're in it to promote the coaches. These are their friends, people they meet. And I bet you for a guy that's national like Klatt, you know, Loxley gets fired. He's the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma next. If he trashes him, Mike's going to, you know, hear that. And he's going to say, you know, dude, get get out. Why are you throwing shade at me when I was at Maryland? So these guys, you know, they're, they're in it to promote the sport. And if Maryland's playing great, they're going to talk about Maryland. A lot of Michigan wasn't. They were clearly prepared to talk about Michigan blowing the game out. Yes, but. we during the game, we commented, boy, somebody somebody over there at Fox is calling the Big Ten Network right now saying send us some stuff on Maryland. Maryland's in this game. They're not, they didn't expect it. That was certainly, that broadcast was set up to be a very pro-Michigan broadcast on purpose. And how, why ever and however Joel Klatt gave props to the Maryland defense. Yeah, the Maryland defense did a pretty good job, but in watching the game, said, man, if this was the guy Tanner Mordecai from SMU, he completes half of those passes. And I think if they roll Cade McNamara out there, it's a completely different game. And maybe the Big Ten quarterback level isn't quite as high as it was before. And I'm looking down this list going, well, Purdue probably makes those throws. Indiana Northwestern, maybe even Wisconsin, I don't know. I, I don't know. This defense, because of the league this year, we might, uh, as far as being Maryland, might still have a seven or eight win season here. Now, are they going to do that in your mind if Lee is actually hurt? Does it does it change the game that much for you on Saturday? I believe that this is a system team. I think Lee is a fantastic player when it's in rhythm. I think when you look at a player like Leah, and I was talking to Jordan about this, um, when he's on. In this system, he knows it. Fantastic. Great quarterback. Unstoppable. Record-breaking. Heisman Trophy winning level. When he's in the game and the game's going his way, he is arguably one of the best quarterbacks in college football right now. And I think he 100% deserves that credit when it's there. When he gets moved off his spot, when there's something not right there, he is bad. He's not okay. He's bad. And... This offensive line that Maryland has, I think, protects him closer to that he can be fantastic if he gets going way. But I, what I'm seeing right now is not an NFL quarterback. It's a really good college quarterback. And I think as Maryland fans, um, with the quarterbacking we've seen over the last 10 years, he's certainly the best out of them. He's Well, that's what everybody brings up. He's the best quarterback Maryland's had in 15 years. When you look at the top, I, I don't have it here. I might get to it later. And say, who are the top Maryland quarterbacks statistically? You go, well, Scott Milanovic. You go, well, he didn't have a great pro career. Second, pretty much, Leah, almost across the board. But there aren't a lot of great quarterbacks. Scott McBride was not a pro quarterback. The guys that made it uh, more of a pro level, Gelbaugh, Neil O'Donnell, Boomer Esiason, they played for a year or two, and they were really good, but it was a different football game. More to your, you know, Charlie Wysocki and his 52 carries against Duke kind of game. More to the Lamont Jordan is 306 yards against Virginia kind of game. Maryland was more of a running team. They had that run at, at that time in between with Duffner and John Kaleo and some of Duffner's guys. They put up, and Milanovic, where they put up these huge numbers, but it really wasn't winning football. And even if you look at, at Friedgen's years, you know, a lot of that was the 50-50 mix. So, anyhow, back, back to what you were saying. If he doesn't play on Saturday, does that really, in your mind, after seeing Billy Edwards up close in Charlotte, very small stadium, you got to see Billy Edwards pretty close, and you saw him on TV on Saturday, kid seems to be able to play. He's not Leah. 
He doesn't have the experience, but it looks like he can play in this system, doing what Maryland's asked him to do. So I think if we're moving towards that, and I'm always in favor, as good as my starting quarterback is, I really don't think that if he can't move around, I don't think 50% oh, yeah, you said this. Leah is better than 100% Billy Edwards. I, I just I have a hard time believing that a lot of the time, regardless of how good these guys are. If you're hurt and you can't stand there and throw the ball or we're not running the ball 40 times today, I don't really think you're the best option for the well, team. I'm going to add one more log to that fire. I, I don't want a 60% Lee out there getting hurt and losing the season. Yeah. The other thing that I will say about him, if he's a little bit banged up and can't move around as much, I'm really interested to see what happens if he doesn't bounce like that in the pocket, if he actually has to step up and step into the throw, if he can't break it outside and he has to stay in there. Because if you watch the plays where Maryland's been sacked this year, a lot of them are quarterback manufactured sacks. He's running into like a contained pocket and he's literally running into the guy's hands. It almost looks like throw out the video game example. If you run contained in Madden, you run right into the blitz. All it, right. it, it happens. Uh, um, so it, it sounds like that you're, whether it's Billy Edwards or Aaliyah, you're okay for Saturday. Does Rakim Jarrett matter if he actually has a concussion? Yeah, that, that really does. See, most people have it the other way. Like, no, Leah, we're going to lose. But, and know. if Rock doesn't play, it's no big deal because, well, Ty Felton will play. Or yeah, who's 15? Osita Smith. Um, Not Oseta Smith, no, Octavian Smith. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I disagree with that. I think that Rakim Jarrett is the most or second most important player on this offense. Mainly because, and I was going to bring this up earlier, I love Dante Demas, but he just doesn't look like Dante Demas at the moment. It's just, It's just not there right now. And maybe it will be there if they need him. I don't think they're really giving him great targets with the ball it right takes, now. Yeah. I uh, don't mean to break into your train of thought. Keep hearing it takes a year. It takes a year. It hasn't been a year. No, it's coming right up it's on It's coming him. up. So if he's going to pick it back up, he's got a few games here in the Big Ten to, to still get it back. Yeah. And I think that we're really good, good in both parts. But Jarrett is getting the ball and he's running – a part of the system that Maryland really doesn't have the backup guy for. Maybe it's Octavian Smith. I it, think is it is on the depth chart. I think it is. I think he's kind of that like running back hybrid lineup in the backfield. But if you look at the touches, quality touches for guys, the pop passes, mm-hmm. the swing passes, who they're throwing the ball to when they need yards, it is Rakim Jarrett. He looks like that guy for Maryland. He's the guy they're pointing to. We need to make a play. Right. Rock Jarrett's getting the ball. He does have the number one jersey. Yeah. I am still surprised. I didn't even – think about going here until you brought that up that still surprised they gave Jay Sean Barham the number one jersey on defense I, I I know you keep saying he's the best guy they have out there uh defensively and maybe he gets to wear that for he's a, just a freshman maybe three or four years of Jay Sean Barham with the one jersey uh I do have to call out by name the offensive line they did a good enough job over the past couple of games they dominated the end of the SMU game Still say if if they give Littleton the ball more on Saturday, we might be talking about an upset win at number four Michigan. Jalen Duncan, uh, think either you or Jordan or somebody brought up that he's now on Mel Kuyper's draft board for like first day draft board. Kuyper's talking about Jalen Duncan. Mason Lunsford plays a lot of redshirt junior. And it looks like he's hurt. It does look like he's hurt. He did play most of the snaps on Saturday. They did move center Johari Branch, and you're talking about a 6'3", 330-pound center. Well, they did moved a couple him back things. to guard. Yeah, he went to guard, and Colton Deary came in. Right. And they're really, really high on Colton Deary. All the recruiting guys from Maryland have been super high on him. The staff was ecstatic when they got him, and Ohio State didn't steal him at the last second. And then they put in Moran. Um, Emilio back, Moran. Yeah, and moved Branch back to center. A couple high snaps in the game, too. Right. Uh, another guard who probably is a tackle you brought up is Spencer Anderson, 6'5", 320. And then to round it out, fifth guy, Delmar Glaze. Maryland has been playing seven guys pretty much every game, sometimes eight, but generally seven guys playing the offensive line. That group, and I've got pictures. You can go up on the Turf Talk website and look at the postgame show from SMU. Some of the shots that we have from 
from up high that show the lanes that these offensive linemen created and how locked into the blocks uh, that they are. It's been an amazing group. Maryland has been deficient in the offensive line year in and year out. And now, and yeah, almost all those guys I brought up are redshirt seniors or, or straight seniors. And almost that whole group is going to move on. But for right now, that is a tremendous resource for this team. And I and, hope and they go lean on these guys to win this game on Saturday. That's why I think if your quarterback's not there, that's a, one of the biggest parts of it, is that these guys are going to be consistent. And I think you should be able to run the ball against a banged-up Michigan State team. But as we're kind of winding down against the clock here, do you think desperation Michigan State matters to Maryland in Mel Tucker's second year there? Do I think the desperation of Michigan State is going to create a game that Maryland might be overlooking them? Is, is that the way yeah. that's asked? I don't know. I, I am starting to buy into the locks. Like we play every game to play that game. That coach focus. I think the team might actually have some focus. I don't think they're too high on themselves from just competing with Michigan. I'd be more concerned about that actually if they beat Michigan that they come in and a banged-up Michigan State team manages to steal a win to sort of remake their season. I think Maryland's going to win this game. And as I said before, before you asked, I think Maryland's going to win three or four or four of the next five or something like that, and then it gets really hard again. Yeah, I can see that too. And I also think it's Mel Tucker's second year there. He just got that massive contract. Yeah. I don't know. There's a ton of transfers that are playing for him. I just don't know if – do you really see that many teams that are that bought into a coach where you're afraid that, you know, coach is on the line? He's not on the line. Game. They're not paying him $90 million, so he's not going they anywhere. Don't, so I, I was reading. Okay, how much do they owe him? Well, it, no, they do owe him that much money. That Michigan State is oddly, like, in the same spot as Maryland right now. They have a couple big donors that really run things over there that are in largely, uh, allegedly kind of tapped out that made the extra – made the extra money happen for Mel Tucker and they're just the money's not there if they want to get rid of this guy the money's just not there in a lot of ways right now uh, in East Lansing surprising as that may be with how successful they've been in basketball and football it's just just really not a lot of not a lot of hype especially with the way the football season's going I had a couple of numbers I want to go over and then I'm sort of done for today uh, and by the way this will be the first game ever at SECU Stadium coming up on Saturday. At the CQ. The CQ. Career passing, as it stands right now. Completions. It's Milanovic is one. Chris Turner, of all people, is two. Leah is third. He's about 160 behind Scott Milanovic, who has 650. Leah's got 491. Move on to season completions. Last year, Leah sets the record. It's 328. He's on top of John Kaleo. Season yards. Last year, Leah had 3,860. That beat Scott Milanovic from 1993. Leah's number one. Season touchdowns. He's tied with Milanovic with 26 from last year. These, these all-time records. I mean, just record after record. Single-game completions. Leah's second. He had a game against Penn State at 41. Single-game yards. Leah all-time third he had a game against indiana that we went to it didn't seem like that big a deal at 419 yards against indiana last year so career touchdowns he's already third in the program he's got the rest of this year and i guess he has the option to actually come back for one more year he would be the all-time by far career yards he's down about 1200 to scott milanovich maybe a couple more um leah's fourth at the moment Every record you look at, he's in there. Yeah, and that's with, even if he comes back next year, that's three full years in the COVID year where he didn't even play all the games. And he's that far up on the record. So that just kind of shows where the, to me it's, yes, he's really good and maybe he breaks those records regardless of his, you know, era of football that he's playing in. Just shows every school is like this right now. Every NFL team is. This guy's breaking this record. That guy, it's almost, it's like college lacrosse or shot clock era basketball right now. Everybody's running the spread, putting up these massive numbers. And you said it. He breaks that completion record or second in it, game completions. They lost that game by 20. A lot. Yeah, that's last year's Penn State game, isn't it? Yes, that's last yeah. year's Penn State game. Milanovic set the record losing to Florida State back in 1995. 
Milanovic is one, Lee is two, Milanovic is the third, fourth, fifth, tied for sixth, 11th, 12th, 13th. Scott Milanovic pretty much dominates this record book from the mid-90s. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, but they threw the ball a lot. He he was he was really good. They didn't win much, but he, he dominated. That was a fun team to watch. All right, predictions for Saturday, 3.30, Fox Sports 1. at First game, CQ Stadium. It's on the field. Haven't updated any of the signage yet. Classic Maryland fashion, midseason stadium name change and field name change. Um, get out there if you can. Ticket sales not looking good, according to our friends over at MarylandWillWin.com that tracks the ticket data. Looking like a crowd mid-30s at the best right now. Maryland still finds a way to score. They do run the ball a little more. Getting to the 30s, I'll go. Somehow you get to 33, Chad Ryland chips in. You get 33 to 17 turtles. 33 is a tough score to hit if you're not missing extra points, which I don't think Chad Ryland will do. Uh, Terps roll big. Uh, Michigan State's in big trouble this year. Maryland 42, Michigan State 21. Okay, on my 33, I'll take 31 plus they block a punt for a safety. That gives me Look, 33. Maryland's been so- – Ty Felton hasn't been solid on special teams, but Maryland has been ha- – solid on special teams and Chad Ryland he changes the game it's like almost having like a great quarterback guy that hits back-to-back 50 yarders hitting every ball out of the end zone it's it's a must if you want to win at this level you gotta have a kicker like him okay so uh, my my get out question is you know the schedule we've been over this a hundred times can you get to eight if if nothing yeah, really bad if nothing really bad happens can you get to eight I think even if you lose one or two guys which is gonna happen you're three and one right now. You win this week. That's four. Next week, the week, you know, you beat Purdue, you beat Indiana, you beat Northwestern. That's seven. And then somewhere between at Wisconsin, that game in Happy Valley and that Rutgers game, you gotta win one. I'm not seeing, other than Ohio State, a team that I'm like, that team's gonna, you know. Yep. Absolutely. Because you know Maryland's gonna show up for that Penn State game. Right. For those of you watching this on YouTube, because we're now simulcasting on YouTube as well. Uh, please let us know if you like it. There's some new graphics up there, and uh, we, we love expanding the audience. And for those who, who do see us at the games, please uh, continue to say hi and give us any pointers or tricks or tips that you have uh, to make this a better show. Mason, thanks for having me. Yeah, and make sure to give us a follow at YoungTurp1 on Twitter. we got great coverage of game day, uh, our favorite pictures between the two of us that we take uh, from the field and from the stands at the games and make sure to subscribe to us if you're watching on youtube uh sure you've seen our other stuff out there but a lot of great content post game shows uh cool timeout reels team running out of the tunnel we try and capture it all for you guys and as always thanks for listening